So I'll just uh, now like to introduce our talk. Um, so we've got C. Lee, Catherine Wright, uh talking about um, change, change management, and, and dealing with change to a degree. Um, so I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty excited to hear this talk. I met Z, we think it's about four years ago. So in a former place I used to work with, we. We took a little uh, trip up to Trade Me. You were in the Trade Me property team. Property team. Yep. I'm leading the Trade Me property team up there, um, and and it was a cool visit. Really nice to see the way they'd arranged their office and, and quite a, you know quite an engaging way. And uh, I remember that uh, visit quite fondly. And now um, the change change topic is also quite. A, you know, really of interest. I mean, change, from my experience, it's, it's one of the hardest things um, that you have to manage and go through in business. Um, and I like the fact that this is kind of, you know, it's outside the purely technical realms as well. It's kind of a business problem. Um, so hopefully we'll learn a bit of how to do that. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Nick. Um, we're sharing a microphone today, so if we stick to each other, there's a reason why. Uh, so that people back at home, on YouTube, on the meetup sides can hear us. So firstly, hope you had some really good canapes, lovely venue. Did you realize you've been part of change this morning? Because we have changed the venue time. So Jenny asked me to speak. Um, she approached me, I think, a couple of months ago. And she said, um, can you make one of these meetups? It's at 6 o'clock in the evening. And I thought, I've got two young ones at home. You know, we're trying to juggle parenting and life in general. And it would be really hard for me to commute down from Auckland. Uh, but Jenny was, was really excellent. She was really open-minded. And she said, uh, why don't we run an experiment? So you are, being, you are part of an experiment here. And it has worked. <clears throat> So we embrace change every day. And whether you know it or not, just like today, you've been a part of you're part of change. Uh, what would be really interesting to hear though is uh, what you want to get up from, from this talk. What made you come to this event today? Yeah, any, any, any volunteers? So we've changed the timing, but we've still got a really good turnout. So we want to hear why you decided to come along to this event. So just for the people back at home uh, dealing with fast change, yep. Any other responses? So I just for me as a policy point of view, psychology are kind of like where your kind of process there's a level of transition. So how do you handle that in an organization and what sort of change will work for people? Handling transitions? Yeah. No one else. <laughs> Just for your information, this is not going to be a lecture style event. Okay? Uh, there will be some interactivity here uh, because we want you to experience some of the change principles in order to really understand the best way to manage change. So, uh, just a bit about ourselves. I'm Z, um, this is Catherine, and we're part of Teamworks. Uh, we're, uh, we are a really small agile consultancy and we're quite personal in the way we interact with our clients. Um, this is our, our model for transformation. And the reason I'm putting this up there, it's not a sales pitch, but when you approach an agile transformation, personally, I don't like the word, the term agile transformation because it suggests that agile is the goal, right? But really, it's, agility should be the goal. So if you're thinking that agile is the goal, then that is not the goal. Okay, but essentially there's three circles here in this Venn diagram. When we think about agile transformation, there's the ways of working. So going to a daily stand-up, doing a retrospective, how do you do planning, all that sort of stuff. That's only one part of agile. The other part of agile is product agility. How do you prioritize? How do you keep in touch with market trends? Uh, how do you strategize? How do you do design thinking and human-centered design? That's the other part of agility that we often talk about. Now, the big forgotten part is that circle on the bottom right there, change management. How do we support our people to, through change? How do we see, how do we get our teams and people to see what's in it for them? Just like today, 
We've actually initiated a change where we've changed the venue, we've changed the timing, but you've obviously seen what's in it for you. you you've got some questions that you want to answer. So because you, you can see what's in it for you, that's why you're coming to this event. But how do we help our people understand that? You know, change is essential in this economy, but how do we help our people through change? So this is a really powerful model when you think about agile transformations, approaching it from a holistic systems thinking point of view. Okay, so that's just a bit about the model uh, that we believe in, uh, and a bit of the model that we want to share today as well. Uh, these are some of the, the, the people and organizations we work with. Um, we have applied a change lens with some of these organizations, and the reason we put this up, up there is because uh, our, our friends here are, are pretty, pretty uh, happy to share some of their journeys as well. And I think we have some people from Southern Cross here, hands up. Yeah, awesome, welcome. <laughs> Okay, so um, just a bit about myself. Um, so I'm born and bred in Singapore. I moved here about 19 years ago. Uh, this is my family. They are my anchor. So my wife, Violet, uh, my two kids, uh, Madison and Michaela. Uh, I served in the Singapore military. I grew up there. Um, my fondest memories were of uh, loading missiles onto eight-ton trucks. Uh, <laughs> Pretty scary. They do have protocol though because the missiles have to point away from you. There's a good reason for that. <laughs> uh, I'm a, I grew up doing Chinese martial arts, so that's me performing the nine section whip at the Auckland Lantern Festival. Uh, so that's me in my personal life. Uh, as part of my professional life, uh, I have recently graduated from Mercury, uh, spent two lovely years there, uh, doing a lot of agile coaching and visual facilitation. Uh, and that is one of my fondest memories on the bottom right where um, we uh, graphic recorded uh, a session with the engineers in Rotorua talking about the history of their geothermal fields. Uh, and uh, Jenny was part of that event as well. Um, and it was an incredible way to really bring people together. And it was so awesome to see how people embrace different ways of working. Uh, prior to that, uh, I met Nick at, at TradeMe. And we, I took him through TradeMe. Uh, and this is the sort of environment that I love to create. Um, the, uh, the passion for learning uh, and having that environment where people can really thrive and innovate. Uh, that's the sort of uh, joy and experience that I want to share with you guys today. I want to share with my clients as well. Uh, and prior to that, I was leading the digital team at Barrow Media. And this is Catherine. I'm going to stick close to you. Just I'll stand close to Z so you can hear me. So thanks for having us today. Um, I'm Catherine. A little bit about me. Um, I've got a little bit of, you can see it, of a nature thing going on in my About Me slide. And I think the reason for that is that about almost a year ago, my partner and I, that's clear there with the, with the dog, uh, decided to move down to, from Auckland to Whirianga to have a year of living somewhere differently. Um, downsize our life a little bit, simplify a little bit, take a little bit of time out. So that was, um, that was some, a change in, um, in our personal situation. Um, and it's really given us the opportunity, or me the opportunity, to, to look at my work a little bit differently. So it's opened up some doors around remote working and um, helped me make some new connections. So some unexpected things have happened as a result of that sort of physical move um, out of Auckland and Whirianga. So we took our two fur babies with us. So Mouse uh, is actually a dog. Her name is Mouse. The dog is at the top uh, left and Bosco at the bottom Right, so uh, Mouse is 14, she's having a really nice retirement at the beach at the moment. Um, also my nieces are up there, family at like Z is a really big part um, of our lives. So my Alice niece Stella with the ice cream at the top, that's, I think that's the zoo. And uh, my youngest niece Ruby had drawn a picture of me, which I thought was pretty damn good actually, pretty talented. So, and last but not least, some cakes. I don't know if you can see those on the right hand side. That was a happy memory for me going out for cake with my mum in Auckland, and they were they were you can't see them very well, but they were like little works of art. These cakes, and they tasted just as good. So, um, those are all the things that I love and laugh just up there. It's me. Now there is a reason we started off with our personal introductions because people are the center of everything we do and oftentimes when we're at work we forget that it's about the people. <clears throat> you can't affect change, you can't deliver great products, you can't deliver great services for customers without people and the customers themselves are people as well. I, I'm, 
I'm quite fond of this Maori prophet. I'm not going to attempt to say it, uh, but in English, um, it says, ask me what the most important thing in the world is, and I will tell you it is people, it is people, it is people. So bringing that into the context of today's talk, people are at the center of Agile. Is everyone familiar with the modern Agile values here? Who's not familiar? I'll just do a brief introduction. Who's not familiar with the modern Agile values? So Agile's come from the world of software development. It's a really great way in which software teams have been working for a long time now. Um, and it's been universalized by um, a chap called um, Josh Karevsky uh, into these four universal values. Um, the first being making people awesome. So that's not only your teams, but your customers. So making your customers feel awesome through every interaction with yourselves. Delivering value continuously. Delivering value in little steps, bite-sized pieces, so that your customers benefit at every step of the way. Yes, so not waiting six months to deliver a project, but maybe delivering some sort of a part of a project every two weeks, little bits of value. Making safety a prerequisite. What do we think that means? I said this was not going to be a one-way lecture. Making safety a prerequisite. Safety should be the default option in whatever you might decide. Do no harm. Do no harm, but also giving your teams the right environment, psychological safety to do their best work, right? Uh, and lastly, experimentation and learning rapidly. You know, so that's embracing not only failure, but learning from failure. So these four things here are pretty universal, aren't they? They don't just apply to software development. So Agile is now, you know, quite a, the default way of working for many organizations outside of the software industry. But at the heart of it, is people. <clears throat> you can't have experimentation without people. You can't have safety without people who think that way. You can't deliver value without people. You can't make people awesome without people. <laughs> so people are at the, at the heart of everything. Okay, so um, now I'm going to start talking about the similarities between agile and change management. They go hand in hand because people are, people are at the heart of both these practices. Change management management's about getting people to see what's in it for them and supporting them along the way. And Agile is about getting people to collaborate using those four modern Agile values. Now, rather than talk too much, I'm going to break the ice with an icebreaker, so hold that thought there. And I'm going to give you three minutes to meet three people the catch is that you have to shake hands with your left hand. I'm going to ask for a change here. Okay, so this is a change talk. So you should have expected to come in here to be challenged, right? So I'm going to start a timer. Three people, you're going to meet three people, and you're going to introduce yourself, but you're going to shake hands with your left hand, and we'll see how that feels, okay? So three minutes. Thank you, Timer. I'm gonna I'm gonna wait for the timer to stop here. Okay, it's stopped now. Can I have a volunteer pair? Someone who shook hands with another person. A pair. We've got prizes, we've got these uh, desktop organizers. 
Kanban organizers valued at $30 each. <laughs> Can I have a volunteer pair? I'm going to interview you with these questions here. Any volunteers? Okay, right. yeah. And who was your partner? Did you have some, someone? Okay. <laughs> so firstly, we're gonna. Okay, so turn around for the camera, and we're gonna get you to shake hands. All right, just give us a little demonstration there. Okay, cool. So we've asked you to make a change. How did you find that? I found it was really easy, actually, easy. because, I mean, you know, we knew it was coming. Yes. I think that's the main thing. We actually knew what we were going to do, so we had no trouble doing it. Yeah, so you've been change managed. You knew it was coming. Yes. What about yourself? What was your name? Hey, I'm Siren. Siren? He was okay about it, so then I was okay about it, but it feels a bit weird. It's like standing on one foot and going, hello. <laughs> so what do you think would have made it easier for yourself? Oh, it's easy because he knew what he was doing. If he didn't, I'd be like, oh, cool, we're both going to stutter now. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, so we've, we've affected a change here. And it's not that hard, is it? It wasn't that hard. No. Okay, thank you very much. Here's your desktop organizers. There we go. Thanks for that. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you a story here. Any scouts in the room? Four scouts, yeah. So if you're a scout, you know that you shake hands with your left. So it must have been easy for you guys because you're used to doing this. Now, so I was a cadet scout. Um, and I'm used to shaking hands with my left, okay? So there is a story behind this. Um, so the left-handed handshake is a, it's, it's a formal way of greeting other scouts used by, of both genders uh, and is used by members of the scout and guide organizations around the world. Yeah? So not just scouts, but girl guides as well. Um, there, there is a little story behind this. Uh, so this is the founder of the scout movement, uh, Lord Adam Powell. Uh, and legend goes that um, there was a time where he shook hands with the Ashanti warriors, uh, one of their tribe leaders uh, who welcomed him into their tribe, uh, and um, they shook hands with their left hand, uh, and he, he took no note of that. And the reason for that was because they, in their culture, shaking hands with their left means opening your hearts. So there is a reason for that. And in some variations of the story, it goes on to say that he, um, the, the tribe leader who extended um, his left hand was actually shot in the heart. So um, I'm not sure whether that's true or not, but there are different variations of the story. Um, but now that I know the story and the origins, I can identify with why scouts, scouts shake, hands, shake, sh shake hands with their left hand. So when I meet another scout, Naturally, I know to do this because I understand it and I can see what's in it for me and them. It's a, it's a very, to a scout or a girl guide, it's a very sincere way of greeting someone. Okay, so now that I've told you the story, does that make you feel a little bit better about the exercise? Yeah, maybe if I told you the story beforehand, it would have a different effect. Now, on to what is change management? Yeah, it's about paying specific attention to valuing and actively addressing the people side of change. Okay, so this includes understanding the change, who's driving it, who's involved, who's impacted, and how and what's in it for me, for the different stakeholders. So now I was, um, I love driving down to Hamilton uh, because it gives me time uh, to reflect and, and possibly listen to an audiobook. So. This morning I was listening to an audio book uh, by Gillian Michaels. Anyone know Gillian Michaels? Yep, one of, yeah, correct. The co one, one of the coaches on, the fitness trainers on The Biggest Loser. And she, um, the book's called Unlimited, um, How Do You Lead an Exceptional Life? Great book, by the way, um, listen to that book. Uh, and she talks about how um, she helps her participants in the program through change. Because when you go onto the Biggest Loser program, you, you, you're essentially going through change as well. And she talks about the most powerful change <coughs> coming from participants who really understand why they are on the show. So at the start of the show, you know, she tries to break them down by putting them through these really hard workouts <coughs> and also asking them some really hard questions. Why are you here? And some participants just take the easy way out and they answer with, uh, I, want, I want to lose weight. <clears throat> then she asks, starts to ask, why? Why do you want to lose weight? Because I want to be healthy. But what she's trying to do there is getting the participants to really connect with their why. Why are they really there? So 
so that when you've got someone, the, one of the biggest loser participants um, sprinting on the field, they connect that sprinting with sprinting with their children, and sprinting with their grandchildren. When they're lifting weights, maybe it's a parallel to lifting their partners across the field of life. How powerful is that? Yeah, often the participants that drop out are the ones that don't see what's in it for them. I'm just here because I want to win $20,000. I think it's $20,000, some figure like that. Um, and then she talked about another story where um, she challenged her participants to go surfing. And you know, they, they were grumbling, um, they had, they'd, they'd been given a week's notice, and, but they were grumbling, oh, I'm too big, I'm too fat to go surfing, it's gonna be cold, I don't wanna get sand in my feet. Did someone laugh there? <laughs> but that was asking the participants to go through change, which they thought was gonna be hard. <clears throat> But the luxury of being on a TV program uh, is that you have to abide by the rules. So they gave it a shot and they actually ended up loving it. Yeah, they started interacting with other people on the beach, uh, getting advice from other surfers about how do I surf. Uh, they made some friends and at the end of the session, they were asking, when can we come back for more? In the process of that, they were getting a really good workout, losing weight, but at the end of the session, they were asking, oh, can I take another board next time? When am I, when am I actually gonna have a chance to do this again? Yeah, but something clicked there because they were open-minded. They were willing to give it a try, but more importantly, they were able to see what's in it for them. They were actually able to see and experience surfing. Yeah? So having someone see what's in it for them is such a powerful way to carry them through the change. So why do we do this? Yeah? Why do we pay attention to people? Because it is people who make the change successful yeah? by embedding the culture, living it, making it happen. Uh, and you know, as, as consultants, we go into organizations, we wanna see change being affected from within. Yeah? Change that's intrinsic so that when we leave organizations, that culture continues to live on the people are able to carry that culture on. Any questions? Will you accept this rose? <laughs> so when I was thinking about ways to describe some of the um, success factors for change today, I, um, I started thinking about sometimes it's easier to think about um, good ways of achieving change um, by thinking about the flip side and thinking about change that's gone bad or things that are a bit chaotic or a bit drama filled. So that got me thinking about reality TV for some reason <laughs> and in the making of this slide I learned that I know a scary amount about reality TV. I did too. <laughs> and he pointed out to me as I shared my notes with him. Um, that's a side note. However, when I started thinking about reality TV formats and thinking about um, the purpose of reality TV shows to entertain us, um, what they really need to be entertaining is they, they need some drama, they need some conflict, we think about it, they need some fighting, some intrigue, some betrayal, all of those things. If everybody was getting along great and things were going smoothly, it'd be a pretty boring reality TV show. So that got me thinking about what do reality TV producers do to make sure that there's going to be some drama for us to watch? And as I thought about that, I thought there's, there are some common, some common threads if we, if we think about it, if you have also some knowledge of reality TV, you admit that to yourself as I have had to. Um, and some of the common threads are uh, that the reality TV producers will, at some point along the way, without any warning and without any input from the contestants, they will change up the environment in a way that's quite impactful to those contestants. They'll make a unilateral change, something reasonably significant that will throw, that will create, throw things into chaos and start people questioning 
their, um, their place on the show. So if we think of some examples, um, one example from, you may have seen The Bachelor, The Bachelorette, um, could be where people are starting to build their connection with The Bachelor or Bachelorette. They've lasted a few weeks now, things are going well, I believe that they're, um, they're, they're creating that connection. And the producers will bring in some new contestants into the show. And that inevitably will cause some drama, will cause some jealousy, will cause, disrupt the connections that people think they've built, the security that they might have started to build up over the weeks as they start to envisage winning the prize and the bachelor or bachelorette at the end. Another example could be Big Brother from Times By. I don't think Big Brother's on our screens anymore, but they would do a similar thing with intruders. So people would be building their alliances and their friendships and they'd be lasting and starting to envisage that I might win this thing and win the money. All of a sudden intruders are in the house in week 8 or 10 or whatever it is and things are turned upside down. There's no warning, there's no, there's no input from the original contestants. Or another example might be Survivor, so where you have tribes and it's all about alliances and building your alliances within your tribe and all of a sudden parts of the tribe or individuals are switched into, into another tribe. And that happens without any warning, without any input, and people that um, previously were the enemy and that perhaps you didn't like very much, all of a sudden those people on that show are having to find, a, find their feet and find a new way of, of getting it together really, really quickly. So, so the, that's the flip side. So um, the, the, the tactic that, that reality TV shows use in creating some drama is, is seems to be very effective in making that happen and, and entertaining us, uh, which is good for free out reality TV purposes, but as you can imagine, not so great for creating high performing, high trust teams of people who think about what we're trying to achieve. So, whoops, I've gone the wrong way. So why is that? So why um, why is this kind of change quite difficult for us to adjust to? And sometimes if we bring it back to changes in our own lives, it, it, it starts to illustrate this point a little bit more. So we're having to deal with changes, as Zia's already talked about today, um, in, in all kinds of ways every day. So there's changes that we choose to make in our own lives. It might be learning a new sport, hitting that damn golf ball, learning how to do that um, can be something that's very unfamiliar and very frustrating at first and over time you develop some skill and ability and it gets easier. Learning to drive, if you think back to when you first learned how to drive a car, especially if it was a manual back in the day, um, how unfamiliar that felt and how uh, much there was to think about that took up your brain space as you, as a learner driver, tried not to stall the car, thought about the indicator, the other traffic, not hitting the curb, all sorts of things that required quite a lot of thought and attention that now for us um, is second nature and um, we can almost do on autopilot quite scarily. Then there's other changes that we don't choose in our lives. So there's things like Adjusting to climate change, we need to find different renewable sources of energy, all sorts of changes in that space. Natural um, disasters that occur that we have absolutely no control over, uh, other sorts of changes that happen in our lives. So it, it, it's demonstrating that, um, that change can be really challenging, even changes that we select for ourselves, like the driving example. And... Um, one of the other characteristics of change, I guess, when thinking about these examples, is that it's also very personal. So our experience is very individual to us. So if we think about the golf example, there are people with, that I'm very jealous of, fantastic hand-eye coordination, who can pick up a golf club or a hockey stick or a tennis racket and just um, play. And they're, they're pretty good at it straight off the bat. Um, whereas others of us takes a long, long time, and there's lots of swinging and missing completely. 
So that's, we're experiencing that change really, really differently, just depending on our personal characteristics. Um, the other characteristic around change for us as humans is that there's an emotional component as well. So it's personal to us, our, our experience, and there is an emotional component. So you might be able to think of a time where logically in your head you knew that a particular course of action or a particular change was the right thing to do, but your, your heart kind of wasn't in it, you couldn't get, couldn't get excited about it. So that's an example where um, we need to recognise you know, there is that emotional component um, to change as well. So how do we reject the rose, we're not going to go down the reality TV path, and, achieve, uh, and um, accept our change challenge? So how do, we, how do we set ourselves up for success in, um, in our workspaces around change? And so um, I've just got here some of the sort of key factors that we think about really closely when we're working with our clients on, on change. And one of the first things is working with leaders and teams to build a shared understanding of what it is that's changing and why we are doing it. And this might sound like the most blindingly obvious piece of advice that you've ever heard. Really, really obvious thing to do. But it's amazing how often in our busy lives and our busy work lives, this step can get skimmed over or we think we've completed it and you know, everyone's aware of this, we don't need to rehash this already. Um, but if you think about um, changes in, in organisations you've worked for where oftentimes um, for a particular change there might be a group of people or an individual or, or, or a team who have been thinking about this change for a long time, they're excited about it, they're fully on board, they're champing at the bit, their, their heads are in the future. Sometimes that group of people can be us working, working, in, um, working on different projects and working to make change happen in organisations. But what we've got to also remember is that there may be another group of people or people all, anywhere on the spectrum who are going to be impacted or involved in this change in some way who are in a completely different headspace to, to the headspace of the champions and the people pushing forward. And so by focusing and just paying some specific attention, as Z said earlier, to um, what, what it is that, that's happening and, and the why, it can start to bring some shared understanding um, to both of those extremes. We're thinking about those two, two extreme um, streams on the spectrum of those groups. So for the champions, they can start to understand that others might have questions they might have um, real concerns about what the implications are for, for this change. They might have some really fantastic ideas for how to make it better and shape it up in a different way. And for the stragglers, spending some time around creating a bit more of a shared understanding can help them at least get their head into the space of building some awareness around what's going on. They might have been completely um, not even aware that this thing was coming down the path towards them. One of the other key things that we, we do and focus on really strongly um, in our work is connect the why to a shared purpose, um, so the organisation's strategic goals and values. And the, the reason why we do that is because it helps to create, rather than a sense of, somebody's been to a conference and come up with a fantastic idea and now we're going in this direction, if we can connect the change to a more shared purpose, then it can create a more compelling why story for all those individuals that are on the spectrum of excited to not excited about this change. So it can just create a little bit of a stronger foundation for um, the team and for the leaders and for the people involved as to why do we bother doing this? There is, some, there is some connection there. Communication around the change, obviously, is a really, really huge component. And one of the words I should have put up, put up there as well is engagement. 
Um, so rather than communication can be a little bit one way, it's a little bit of a one way connotation. Whereas engaging with the, with people who are going to be impacted or going to be part of it or might in some way be involved, um, engaging is a two way street. So that's making sure that we are really, really actively listening to understand what this change means to individuals uh, and, and teams and people. And in that way, we can avoid making assumptions about someone's being a resistor, they're being difficult, they're whatever it might be. We can strip away some of those assumptions and start to unpack a little bit um, what might be going on that's preventing people from feeling good about this change. And that then enables us to think about what are some practical support um, ideas or activities that we can put in place that will actually be uh, welcomed and will actually be helpful for, um, for people involved. So it's around seeking that feedback. And if we do that, we're setting ourselves up for a better chance of success. So if, we, if we're paying attention to the people side of what we're trying to achieve here, then we're helping to um, smooth the path is what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to make it easier for people to jump on board. We're also benefiting from a diversity of ideas and input by making sure that conversation is ongoing around the shared understanding and creating that space for learning and experimentation. So one of the success factors on the previous slide that I didn't have up there is kind of encapsulated in this slide is around celebrating success. So that's another aspect that we can be thinking about and paying some specific attention to. So as not to forget that along the way, let's just acknowledge and make visible and um, celebrate not just the big milestones, but the smaller steps along the way that we're making. And because we're naturally forward looking, you know, we're trying to achieve the next thing and the next thing, it can be really easy to, to um, still think there's so much, there's such a mountain to climb. <coughs> But if we stop and think about it, there often are, if we think back to a month ago or two months ago or six months ago, where we were then, there often are things that we can identify that are worth celebrating and can help reinforce and create that momentum for the change that we're trying to achieve. I'll just pause for a minute. Are there any burning questions before we move on? No burning questions, but I'm going to burn my manager and embarrass him. <laughs> so I haven't really worked with change managers um, until quite recently, maybe two or three years ago when I was first hired at Mercury Energy. Um, so I had taught a course at Mercury and uh, Steve in, in the front said, hey, come, come work for us. Um, we, want, we want an agile delivery person. Um, and I thought, yeah, so we've got an organization here that wants to do more agile stuff. Um, and then this is me here uh, on the second day of work on my e-bike. I lived in Ellerslie, rode to work. I was amped and psyched to go. I've been sold this dream. We're going to go agile in this organization. And we are pretty agile here at Mercury. This, this is a recorded talk, so pretty agile here at Mercury. Uh, and it is a great place to work, by the way, so come work for Mercury. But what I did was I floated a trial balloon, I think, on my third day of work. And what I did was um, I put up these modern agile uh, meeting charters. They were, I put four of them around the office, um, one by the lift, uh, one in the kitchen, one in the common area. Uh, and someone actually came up to me and said, hey, yeah, that's really awesome. I think we could use some of this in our meetings. What a great idea. I really love what you're doing. So I thought that trial balloon was successful until the fourth day when I rode my e-bike into work and I got a tap on the shoulder. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to mimic this person here. He's a lovely guy. Um, excuse me, how, do I, how, how, how does that... No, excuse me, Z, are you the person who's been putting up these posters around the office? And I said... Maybe. <laughs> and he said, I think you're the person there because look, there's a poster right on your desk. <laughs> um, 
And he asked me this question that I, I never thought about, and it was a great question. How do these modern agile values fit with our company values? And that was, um, that was a golden light bulb moment for me there, because I'd come from small organizations, digital organizations, um, Trade Me, which is um, you know, one of the most well-regarded organizations in New Zealand practicing agile, all gone fully agile, and here I was in a really big enterprise on the start of the journey, and I hadn't considered how agile fit the company values. So that was a, a really good lesson for me. Um, but look, here we are. This is one year later, and Agile is now part of the learning and development toolkit at Mercury, and I'm so proud that the company has come on board this journey, and I'm really proud of my colleagues here in the front row as well, that we've been a part of this journey, we've worked with change management, we've worked with the learning and development team, and we've baked the Agile toolkit into the High Performance Team Initiative. Yeah, so the, 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 a really good way to embed change is, you know, if you're coming into a new organization and you're being asked to do Agile, the first thing is to ask why. What existing frameworks are there? What are you already doing in your HR space? What are you already doing with your L&D programs? What's, what's already out there? Are there any feedback frameworks you can use, you know? Um, are you using any change frameworks? But what's out there? Agile is about incremental bits of value, experimentation and learning, and we want to be applying some of those values to change as well. So like I floated the trial balloon, I thought that was a really good experiment, and we have succeeded. One year later, we're standing here, and people really see what's in it for them and why we want to, why we want to work this way. So I'm going to start to introduce the synergies between Agile and change management here. So I've got um, three of these, um, the Agile values up here. So making people awesome. And it's about applying a strong people focus to enable change, creating happy teams and delighting customers. And then we've got experimentation and learning, which sits at the heart of Agile. And when you're affecting change, you need to be applying this value as well. So floating your trial balloons, putting the feelers out, getting feedback from the teams, getting feedback from people who are affected by the change, creating a safe and inclusive environment, so making sure that people feel really supported. I'm going to give you some examples here. Has anyone ever encountered this scenario where you're sitting at your desk <laughs> and then you get this invite, you are invited to this training program and you think, <laughs> right? But this happens, this happens. This example here is where people are not brought on the journey and they don't see why they need to come to this training program. Yeah, and you'd be surprised as to how many companies do this. They decide, we want to go in an agile transformation and we'll send out all these meeting advice. We'll get these really expensive consultants to come in and train us. And then people don't see what's in it for them and then after that, everything just tapers away. You go back to your day jobs and it just goes poof. Okay, so that is a really bad way to affect change. <laughs> Second example here of a successful change program we've recently implemented with one of our clients. We ran a training pilot with the leadership team. We got the feedback from the leadership team about how their teams would actually perceive the change. So it was an organization um, that is not a software organization and the leaders were especially um, anxious, yeah, to put it really frankly, they were anxious about how the change would be perceived. Agile being a software thing, how does that, how could our people really relate to that? So we put in particular attention to making sure we held their hands, we held the hands of the people during the training day. So during the training day, in the later part of our training day, we call it the one day Agile experience, and in the, in the second part of the training day, we get the teams to use the Scrum framework to build a Lego city. And that is quite a shift for a lot of teams not working in software. And because we run these training programs with so many companies in the IT industry, we, we often take it for granted that people just do get it. So quite often during these training days, we just step back at trainers and let people discover the outcomes themselves. What does it mean to be a product owner? What does it mean to be a scrum master? And they get it 99% of the time. But here we were at an organization that's not 
not used to working in the software world, not used with all this terminology, and the leadership team actually really struggled. So because of that feedback, we were able to tweak the programs. Yeah, so that experimentation. Now one thing we do uh, with, our course e uh, with our courses as well, is we send out homework emails. There's a bit of science behind it. Pedagogy, the science of education, where we get people thinking and engaged about you know, the course even before the course starts. And as part of a change program, sometimes we tweak the homework blurb. Okay? So I want you to compare these two statements here. Okay? The first one saying, interview your manager and write down one thing they'd like to get you out of, out of the agile chain, training. We actually changed that statement for one of our clients to write down one thing you would like to get out of the training. Why do you think the statement on the right might be better? Yeah. Say that again. More buy-in. Buy but also, does this tell you a bit something about the organization's culture as well? Yeah. They really want people to be a part of it, right? So this is another example here. The red is uh, where we actually uh, customize the training, the, the homework email. So from your recent Agile training session invitation from someone, on behalf of Teamworks, our trainers would like to invite you to their experiment, experiential learning. Now, notice the bit in the middle there. You know, normally, we're quite informal about it, and we say, we have a bit of homework we'd love your help with. They changed it up. In advance of the session, we would like you to prepare the following, which will only take five minutes. What does this tell you about the organization's culture there? Busy. Really busy. So we had to be sensitive to that. Yeah, it's only going to take five minutes. And we took out the scrum guide. You don't have to read that. We played the videos during the course. So we adopted a change lens and actually applied that to the homework email before the training even started. I'm getting the hand wave there for time, uh, so I'll just take you through Catherine's example, I suppose, we're a bit short on time. Sure. So when I was thinking about that way to illustrate, um, I guess one, one example that, that was a really, um, another epiphany for me, as, as he talked about, we had with the trial balloon. Um, I was thinking back actually to prior, so I've been working in change management for over 10 years now in different roles, different organisations, permanent roles, and more recently contracting and consulting. But prior to my change management hat, I worked in human resources. So I worked at Mercy Ascot Hospital, and um, this, this, is, uh, this sort of example has really stuck with me through um, my work in change as well. So a really, really busy department um, within that hospital was um, had, had had significant growth over the years. So they were it was extremely demanding, really busy um, um, surgical unit. And as the demand had grown and as the volumes of surgery had increased, um, obviously you can't complete a surgery unless you have the um, nurses, the anaesthetists, and the healthcare assistants and the surgeon themselves. So on the medical side, the staffing had evolved to adjust to that to that growth. Um, but on the administrative side, the reception person, the one reception admin coordinator person for that really busy unit had been just trying to keep up for um, uh, over time as that growth had happened. And so the manager identified that this was no longer sustainable. We reached a tipping point where that person was really working over time consistently and we needed to help them out and, and do something about that. So we went about recruiting for a, um, a, a second uh, person to work in that, um, in that department um, on the reception desk. And we interviewed, we found someone fabulous, and they started, and on day one, the um, reception that that individual got from the incumbent was really negative. They weren't welcomed with open arms, as we had expected that they would be. Um, and the orientation was going really badly, and it was starting to look like this relationship between the new person and the incumbent was really not going well. Now, just really quickly, can you throw out what you think might have been going on there, or what we might have missed in terms of the manager and I around that process? Any ideas? Was the receptionist? Good point. So the receptionist knew about the process was happening, 
but the why I think was missing. We skipped over the why. Yeah, absolutely. So um, for the incumbent, the fact that a new person had been recruited was uh, a criticism she took of her abilities. So she was a very experienced, really competent person, been working there a lot of years, and this uh, fact that we've recruited another person with good intention um, for her was a critique of her skills and abilities. So the why around the reason for that appointment, um, we hadn't created that shared understanding of what we were doing um, for that person who was most impacted. And I thought I was being the hero. I was helping her, I had helped, we had found a really good person and you know, it was all gonna be good. So it really has stuck with me that we can get excited, we can move forward, we think we're delivering something good, but if we just take a moment to think about the individuals and the different perspectives and the unexpected perspectives that can sometimes arise out of something that we think is a fantastic positive change, we can really learn, learn a lot from that. Okay. We will do five minutes of questions and we'll close out with an exercise and a survey, I think. Questions? <clears throat> Have you ever run across or worked with organisations with a lot of the staff regarding agile and really busy work? I say my partner was working for the university for a while, they were introducing some agile practices. Quite a lot of the people there were actually extremely hostile and thought that agile meant they were going to lose their job and that things were going to be the same and they got very negative. Have you run across that? So the question is Have we come across uh, organisations? where people are hostile to Agile? Yes, yes, we have. Um, and I guess people come with experiences and they might have had a bad experience in the past and often trying to understand what those experiences, experiences are, that is a really powerful thing to do because when you convert a resistor, when you listen to the views of resistors, you're able to create the best change because when you bring a resistor onto your side and help them understand what's in it for them, then you're going to have the most successful change. As to whether agile is um, regarded as a, as a hostile word, yeah, some, sometimes because it can seem like a cult. It can seem like you know you got to go to a daily stand up. I got to answer the three questions. Yeah, and, and that that is bad agile. Yeah, that that is doing agile without understanding why it is. Um, you know, quite, quite often when we go into organizations who ask us to do Agile transformations, we ask, what is your end goal? And they tell us Agile is the end goal, and then we ask them why. And we keep asking till we get to the real end goal. Yeah? So there is a technique called the five whys, but an even better one called the nine whys. It's a, <laughs> it's a facilitative uh, technique from the facilitation handbook called Liberating Structures. Yeah, so the five whys is where you just ask why for the sake of asking why, but the nine whys is where you ask why to really understand. So really understand why that word is being treated as a, uh, in such a hostile way. Really, really, really understanding. Question? No questions. <coughs> Well then, a plug for our two courses coming up. We've got two public courses. Um, it's called the One Day Agile Experience. I'm not sure if there's a lot of this stuff here in Hamilton. Uh, so come join us. Um, we teach uh, visual facilitation as well. Come join us um, on the 20th of September and late August as well. And we're going to finish with an activity. Okay, I need a, a volunteer pair again to come up here to shake hands with your left hand and just share your thoughts on today's session. Come on, Nick. Thanks, <laughs> 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 good volunteer. <laughs> Hi. Oh. <laughs> nice. So my thoughts on the session? Yes. Um, lots of food for thought there, isn't there? Just the, some of those examples, um, it just showed, you know, it, it illustrates my point from the start. Stuff is kind of notionally quite easy, 
Um, but there's a lot of there's a lot of ways you can kind of drop the ball, and and you don't help the people come along in a change. Um, so there's actually quite a bit of uh, bit to think about, especially if, you know, if you're making a change that affects a lot of people. You got to try and help them all come along. That's probably my main thought. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, a, a survey. You want to do a survey? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for coming along. Thank, thank you.